grace that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So then it picks up this week talking about being ambassadors of Christ. And it says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now, the reason why I, I wanted to read the last couple verses of our uh, lesson last week is because uh, I think there's a, a misrepresentation uh, of God's word sometimes uh, among, among scholars when they look at this verse, uh, knowing therefore the, the terror of the Lord. And nowadays, you, you get a lot of, of watered down teaching, a lot of watered down doctrine in the, in the church at large. And no one really talks or preaches about the consequences of going against God. Um, everything is about love and acceptance and uh, inclusiveness. I think that's the word, isn't it? Where we just accept anything in the church. And so the, when, when I came up in church, and certainly some of you that's been in church longer than I've been in church, uh, remember that, that hell and brimstone teaching, that if you don't, if you don't get right, you're going to go to hell. If you don't pay your tithes, you're going to go to hell. If you look at somebody the wrong way, you're going to go to hell. If you got an ought against your brother, you're going to go to hell. If you were supposed to fast today until 4 o'clock and you ate at 359, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> if you don't get that thing right. And, 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 but there, there was a lot of, 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 of strength in that teaching in that People didn't feel so comfortable uh, just living any kind of life. But nowadays, because we, we want to be inclusive in the church, and we don't want to offend, that it, it causes us to really kind of water down. And, I, and when I, and I say us and we, I'm not dealing with us and we here. I'm dealing with the church at large. Because, because y'all know as well as I know, Lord, we get the truth here. <laughs> and I mean, it, it, it goes, Pastor say, if it, if it come up, I got to shoot it. And I mean, he'll shoot that thing clear out the sky. So we get the truth here. But in the church at large, it, this is what's going on, is that people are made to feel comfortable. And so the reason why I brought that up is because if you have the expositor, and, and I try to I try to leave the other folks and their doctrines alone, unless it creep in here. But I try to leave it alone. I try as much as I can, but I, and I try to leave the publisher alone because they have such good material. But they've been hitting so much this quarter. Uh, they've been flirting with the line of e unconditional eternal security so much. It's just been bothering me. So I had to, to say something about it because, see, when they dealt with this verse, they talk about how the word terror does not really translate as terror or a reason to be afraid is talking about knowing the love of God, you know. No, and and I, I okay, maybe maybe way down at the end of Strong's definition of terror, way down there, and maybe you see love 
way down the list of all them different words that you could possibly use to put in place of terror. But when you look at the context of the scripture, looking at the last verse that we read on last Sunday's lesson, we know that this is a, 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 a more of a godly fear or reverence because of the possible consequences if we don't do what God says. Because he, he just told us that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> so then he picks it up and said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Because we know that even though God is a loving God and he is a forgiving God, he's such a nice God. God is so nice and, 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 and he's so loving. What one pre I heard one preacher say he's like a big cuddly teddy bear. But if you cross God, God all that fluffiness, <laughs> you, you'll feel, you'll start feeling a, a prick. <laughs> like he told Paul, he said, it's hard to kick against the pricks. That ain't got nothing to do with, 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 with. Mama was loving too. And daddy was loving too. But daddy would take that belt off and he put something on me if I cut up too much. And he loved me. But knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. We, this, is all, this ought to be our motivation as Christians to persuade men to be saved. Because after all, that's what salvation is about. If, 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 if I come down the ocean in a, in a cruise ship and you out there on a float and, and you out there on purpose on the float, I'm not saving you by bringing you up on the boat. You might have been out there just checking things out. But if you was drowning in the ocean, and I pulled you up and put you on the ocean liner, I saved you. That's what salvation is about. Salvation is just not a, a, a club or, or a clique where we just come to church to have a good time and sing good songs and, and hear good music and hear good preaching. This is about our souls being saved, <laughs> which means what did God save us from? He saved us from death. He saved us from hell. Because hell wasn't designed for us. It really wasn't. Hell was not designed for us. Hell or, 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 or Hades or, or, or that, that place of torment was not designed for human beings. It was designed for Satan because that spirit of pride got into him. And he thought that he would exalt himself above the most high. And, and, and Jesus said, I beheld him falling like lightning. And hell was designed when Satan rebelled. But hell was only designed for him and the angels that came with him. But because humans decided they would follow him, and because every day more human beings die without coming, into the knowledge of Christ. Hell just keeps making itself larger. Hell enlarges itself. They always be modeling in hell. <laughs> because God is long-suffering. He don't really want you to go there. But until that day where you die, and it has been determined that you are not saved, hell makes another spot. Yeah, we got another one. Got another one. <laughs> so knowing this, that we all must appear, every last one of us, none of us will escape. <laughs> you may miss a lot of appointments, 
but there's two appointments you will never miss. <laughs> you will never miss these two appointments. You will never miss death. It's appointed to man once to die. And unless you are alive and remain, I should say, you ain't going to miss that appointment. You've got to go through death. And you've got to appear before Christ. You've got to. You have to. Now, depending on how you lived, whether you save or not, depending on what side of the judgment throne you're on. But we all must appear. So knowing this, every time we get a chance, we ought to say, hey, do you know Christ? Do you, do you want to be saved? Now, sometimes we, people don't know that they need to be saved. <laughs> they don't know they need to be saved. And so we talk to them and let them know that they need salvation. Because some people don't know that they need salvation. But knowing the terror of God, how many of us, if there was two pits, no, four pits, we got four exit doors that lead out of this church, right? One, two, three, four. And if there was a pit outside of each door, and that pit was full of hungry lions, full of them, and you know because you done tried every one of the doors and almost fell down into the pit. You tried it. You tried to get out, but the lion almost got you. Some of us might have got halfway down in there and caught on to the side, climbed back out. How anxious would you be if someone was in the building and tried to walk out of the building? How anxious would you be to warn them that there's something outside and you don't want to go outside because you don't want to get eaten up by the lion. That's easy for us to understand in the natural. There's a car accident down the road. Some folks uh, 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 come and kind of block off traffic and get out their car and, and start waving people on try to let them know to get over to the other lane because there's an accident on the side of the road. How many times has somebody told you, child, if you don't stop eating all that fried chicken, you're going to clog your arteries? We interested about arteries, accidents, and pits of lions, but the pit of hell seemed like we'll get on the bus, <laughs> we'll go to work, we'll go to school, We'll even come to church and we'll not let people know if you don't get saved, you're going to miss the rapture. But I will tell everybody, honey, if you don't get that COVID shot, you're going to die. But the same ones, I never hear them say, if you don't live right, <laughs> You're going to hell <laughs> because we put so much stake in this life. And that's why the Bible says that we have hope in, 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 in this life in Christ only. We are men most miserable because there's something beyond this. So knowing the terror of God, we warn people. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not knocking the COVID vaccine. I'm not knocking, pulling over, and letting, and letting folks know there's an accident on the side of the road. I'm not knocking, telling me that I need to stop frying so much chicken and stop putting so much ham hocks in my greens. But what I am saying <laughs> is we've got to be interested in saving folks' souls. Just as much and more as you are interested in saving somebody's natural life, you ought to be more interested in saving their soul. Because one of these days when this life is over, we've all got to answer and give an account for the deeds done in these bodies. We all got it, whether good or bad. And I don't want to get before the judgment seat 
and have to tell the Lord, Lord, yeah, yeah, I did that. Oh, yeah, man, you remember that? Yeah, I did that too. I got to give an account for all of that. And, 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 and like the Bible says that some of our works is going to be burned up. <laughs> but we're we going to be saved, but through fire. I don't, I, I'll take it, but I don't want that either. <laughs> I want some stars in my crown. I, I, I don't want to just build on the foundation hay and stubble and wood. And I want to put some, some, some silver and some gold on the foundation. Because some of this stuff is not going to last that we're putting on the foundation. We've got a foundation. We've got 66 books of foundation, good foundation. And some of us is taking the foundation and we're putting some mess on top of the foundation. <laughs> Knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. So I want the world to be saved. But I also want myself and the rest of the saints to be saved. <laughs> we got to make it too. <laughs> we got to make it now. And, and, and this is the other reason why I, I, I really wanted to, to talk about that. Because if you're not careful, the commentator will make you feel that, you know, you get saved. And once you're saved, you saved, and there's really nothing you can do to change the fact that you're saved. And, and I'm trying not to say once saved, always saved, because you know, y'all y'all know that's wrong. So I'm trying to pretty it up. <laughs> but you know, because our life is hid. Our life is hid with Christ. You know, we, we are secure. <laughs> and so that's what the commentator wants you to feel that. And so when we get to the judgment throne, that we're not going to be judged as far as whether we go to heaven or hell. Because when God saved me on December 15th, 1993, at 7.30 in the evening, that I never have to worry about living right ever again. I could do what I want to do and go to heaven. That's what the commentator, if you're not careful, the commentator uh, kind of give you that impression that, that I, I don't know, I no longer have to worry about going to hell because I'm saved. God saved me. Saved is past tense. That means that I've already got it. And no matter what I do, but Jesus, when he prayed, he told the eternal spirit, he told him, I have not lost any that you have given me, save the son of perdition. So evidently, you can be called by God and lose your place. <laughs> And when the Bible talks about who, he who he foreknew, he predestined, he's not talking about the ones who drop off in the meantime. He's talking about the ones who make it to the end time. Because with, with God, if he speaks something, it has to come to pass. So when God said, I, gotta, I have predestinated, the, the, the saint, that's not talking about the tear. <laughs> I don't care what kind of tongue he speak in. The tear is not predestined because the tear is going to be uprooted and cast into the fire. The foolish were not predestined <laughs> because if God says you're going somewhere, he said before one jot or tittle of my word fell, heaven and earth shall pass away. So not even the, the seed that was on the stony ground and that plant sprung up and the sun scorched it. If they was predestined to make it, <laughs> they would have made it. He predestined those who he foreknow, those he predestined. Why? To be conformed to the image 
And hopefully we all fall into that group. But knowing this, we persuade men, those in and those out. Because all of us at some point is going to miss the mark. Amen. <laughs> all of us is going to miss the mark. I'm telling you, I got a testimony. I'm going to tell it one day. I'm gonna, one day, I'm going to tell it. But I'm telling you, I done missed the mark. Sometimes, you know, you know what? You have to be aiming for the mark to miss it. Sometimes I wasn't even aiming for the mark. <laughs> the mark was over there. I'm shooting that way. <laughs> missed the mark. Wasn't even aiming for it. All of us experience that. But knowing that the terror of God we have to encourage each other. Sister, hold on. I know. I know it get hard sometimes. But hold on. I know. I know you missed it. Yeah, that was bad. But hold on. Don't stay in your mess. Get out of it. Because the judgment of God is coming. We persuade men. For we commend you, verse 12 in our lesson, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give uh, you an occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not of heart. Verse 13, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Basically what Paul is addressing is the fact that there was some saints in the Corinthian church that would not accept Paul. They wouldn't accept Paul for a couple reasons. One, a lot of them knew where he came from. And it's hard to get saved from sin. And I mean what folks call big sins. It's hard to get saved from some sin and people trust you. That's hard. That's hard. That's hard. Let me try to make it as personal as I can. It would be hard for us if the leader of the Ku Klux Klan came to Praise Temple Apostolic Church and went down in the water in Jesus' name, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. So I mean, He filled him up. All of our spirits bear witness of it, and I mean, we bear. We knew He had the Holy Ghost. It would be hard for a lot of us for the for the Klan member, the Klan leader. To sit in church with all that Holy Ghost. <laughs> Why? Because we remember what the Klan did. How do you think the church felt about Paul? Paul held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen. He held their coats. In other words, he was saying, get them. Go ahead and get them. Handle my light work, and I'm going to hold y'all coats, which means y'all don't have no beef with me. Let me hold your coats. That means you're welcome to come back. You can be comfortable with me. This was Paul. He persecuted the church. That's how much zeal he had. He was killing Christians and consenting to their death. So the church remembered where the clan leader, Paul, came from. And some of them questioned whether or not he really had the apostolic authority that he said he had. Oh, Paul ain't about nothing. Yeah, I heard he got a reputation around town. Who he think he is? The man was just killing us. He, he probably just became an apostle undercover so he could get close to us to kill us from the inside. Paul, who? An apostle? <laughs> An elder? A bishop? <laughs> you say you a deacon? A deacon of what? I remember who you was when you was out in the world. 
You was you was smoking dope, dealing dope. <laughs> and, and, and now you call yourself a what? <laughs> uh, you, you a preacher <laughs> of righteousness? Oh, Lord have mercy, please. Because <laughs> I remember when you were running women, drinking so much, and half the time I seen you in the street, you didn't know where you was. And now you say you a what? A minister of what? Reconciliation? You can't even reconcile your checking account. <laughs> you a minister of what? This is how they treated Paul. Because Paul, and, and here's the other thing about Paul. Paul was not like Apollos. Apollos, Apollos was real. They say he was polished. He had, Apollos had a silver tongue. He never stuttered. He never had to comb through the, and let's say, okay, where, where, do I, where do I need to go? Oh, yeah, yeah, Psalms, Psalms, yeah, go to Psalms. Paulus was mighty in the scriptures. <laughs> he, he had it going on. Paul wasn't like that. And so, and, and the Corinthians, because they were so worldly, they were a worldly church. I mean, they were gifted now. They were gifted they had everything, it, it, to put it in today's time, you had so many good preachers come out of Corinth, so many good musicians come out of Corinth, you had praise team leaders in Corinth, you had the ushers of ushers, everybody who was anybody was at Corinth. If Corinth, if, if a church needed something, Corinth could supply it. They had all the gifts, but they were so worldly. And so because they were tied up in the world, Paul didn't fit the resume, they trying to hear all of this vain philosophy and all of this stuff, that all of this garbage, and they want the preacher to come in and say, touch your neighbor seven times and, and push them over and pour oil on them and turn them around 20 times. And, and This is what Corinth was looking for, but because Paul preached Jesus <laughs> and him crucify and then say, I, I don't want to know anything else. Corinth couldn't really get with that because they were looking for something a little more polished and a little bit more eloquent. Somebody had a had little better diction when they speak. So Paul didn't really fit what they wanted. And, and Paul knew that. Paul knew. So Paul always wanted them to know that, look, this is not me. This is not me. I'm not doing this, I'm not preaching, and half of y'all don't even believe that I'm called to preach in the first place. I'm not doing this for fun. If I was doing it for fun, I'd go start a church where the folks want to hear me. <laughs> but Paul says, for the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge if that one died for all, then we were all dead. In other words, I'm not doing this because I want to. I'm doing this because one day I was on my way to Damascus to persecute the church, and the Lord knocked me off my beast. And when I looked into heaven, there was a light that shined brighter than the noonday sun. And he said, Paul, why per persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, who thou persecutest. And he called me and took me to the backside of the desert for three years and taught me the same things that he had taught the other apostles. And I didn't hardly believe it myself, so I took a journey. And I went and compared notes with Cephas and the other apostles and found out the same thing that Jesus taught me. He taught the other apostles, so I wouldn't have went behind. The Lord called me to do this. So I'm doing it. And here's the other thing. That if one died for all, then we were all dead. You know, any, anybody who, well, let me say it like this. If, if you in the, in the streets, you run the streets. I ain't talking about just walking down the street. I mean, you run the streets. And, uh, and, and, uh, and the group of guys getting ready to kill you and a, another group come and they save your life, what do that mean? You owe them. You have a debt that needs to be paid. 
You owe them your life. <laughs> we were all dead in trespasses of sins. So if God called me to do something, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I owe him. I owe him because he paid everything for me. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. So I can't live for me. I can't do everything that makes flesh feel good. I can't do it. Why? Because my life is not mine. And that's what we miss out on in, in the church as believers. We want to be saved, but we want to do us. <laughs> I just want to do my own thing. But if you want to do your own thing, you could do your own thing out in the world. <laughs> but if you became quickened in your spirit, you owe God your life. <laughs> He's the one that gave you the life. Now, it's not I that live. <laughs> But it's Christ that lives in me. So I have to live according to what he wants. And I'm telling you, I said last week, the way of a transgressor is hard. And that means that all of our flesh is hard. <laughs> because our flesh wants to transgress. Our flesh don't want to do right. Our flesh don't want to do right. Period. They don't want to. But we live the life that we live because we owe it to him. He saved our life. We understand that on the job. If we were sleeping out on the street and the, and the man came and gave us a job and paid us $100 an hour, we would do whatever he asked us to do. If he said, don't go to church on Tuesday and Sunday for $100 an hour, I'm, a, I'm not going to listen to the live stream, but I'll have it playing. So if the pastor say, did you catch the live stream? Yeah. <laughs> because we, we feel like we owe that man a, 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 a somewhat gratitude for what he did for us. But think of what God did for you. When you was dead in trespasses and sins, he quickened you. He gave you a hope, gave you joy, gave you his spirit, and gave you a hope of eternal life. We owe him. <laughs> we owe him. Wherefore, henceforth, 16, know, know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now, this, this, is, this is the issue in Corinth. You know, it's, so, some of them were kind of puffed up. And, and some of them felt like because they may have had some type of association with Christ while he was yet in the flesh, that that somehow transferred over to the new dispensation. Because, oh, I walk with Christ. Oh, I, I heard his teaching. I was one of the 5,000 that he taught that I seen him breaking apart the fish and the loaves, and I ate, and there was left. I was there. I witnessed all that. But under the new dispensation, none of that mattered. <laughs> Just because you knew him then, it's, it's a new Jack City. <laughs> Y'all, somebody all remember that movie? <laughs> this, this is a new age. And your association with Christ before he died does not matter now. Now you've got to be saved and live holy just like everybody else. That's why I don't understand how... Uh, that that certain church deifies the Mother Mary. Because Mother Mary was in the upper room getting filled with the Holy Ghost, 
just like everybody else. <laughs> because your association to Jesus in the natural, it didn't carry over to the new dispensation. None of that mattered. Because why? Look at the next verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You've been born again. Nothing that you did before you got saved mattered. I don't care how many degrees you had. I don't care how smart you are, how big your bank account is. I don't care. When you get saved, you are born again. You are newborn, just like the first day you came into this world. Old things are passed away. Everything's gone. My old way of thinking is gone. That old lifestyle is gone. And though we may struggle in the flesh, we ought not ever struggle so much in the flesh as born-again believers that we make sin our lifestyle. Because the Bible says that he that sinneth not. <laughs> we don't make a lifestyle of sin. We don't practice sin. Because he that is born of God sinneth not. They don't make a practice of sin. And all things are of God, who have reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's why he saved us. He didn't save us to play the organ or be a deacon or be a minister or be, be an elder or be a preacher or be a piano player or be an usher or a greeter. God didn't save us for any of that. It's nice that we do it. He gave us talents and he gave us gifts for the perfecting of the body of Christ and for the, you know, to edify the body. He gave us those gifts for that reason. But the reason why he saved us is to be ministers of reconciliation, to be ambassadors, to represent him. Friends don't have ambassadors in the United States just to come over here and live good and make good money and never care anything about the affairs of France. <laughs> they called ambassadors to come over here and strengthen relations and other, other reasons why they sent ambassadors to this country. God didn't just save us to enjoy all of the different benefits of being saved, but not save nobody else. <laughs> He said, go into the highways and hedges and compel men to be saved. And he said, that why? That my house may be full. I'm not going to count the empty seats. But the empty seats is a reminder of the work that we have to do as children of God. He said, that my house might be full. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. But wait, I thought the, the professor told me that, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was equal in essence and equal in power. That's what they said. That's what the, that's what the doctor of divinity taught doctor of theology. He taught that, that, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they're all equal in power, equal in essence, but they're separate and distinct manifestations of the triune God. <laughs> That's what the theologian said. But the scripture says, and we know, I'm on the wrong page, to wit God was in Christ. Now, if, if, <laughs> if the son was distinct and he was separate, but he was equal in essence and equal in power, why would God need to be in <laughs> the son? That's what the theologian says. They're all separate. But let's turn to 1 Timothy. Time is going out, so first first Timothy. In order to be a minister of reconciliation, you got to know who God is. 
And it can't be a question in your mind, well, is it three, is it four, is it two, is it one and a half, how many gods is there? Is it the universe? Is it Mohammed? Is it Jehovah? Is it Yah? Is it Jah? Who is it? <laughs> when you a minister of reconciliation, these questions can't be going through your mind all the time trying to figure out. You've got to know who God is. And that's why when God called Moses, the first thing he did with Moses, he says, I got to show you who I am, and I got to show you what I can do. Because we're ministers of reconciliation, and if, I, if I'm out there trying to reconcile the world to Christ, and I'm confused, and I don't even know who Christ is, and I'm sitting there debating with the Muslim, and next thing I know, I'm in the Muslim church because he done persuaded me. <laughs> First Timothy, you got to know who God is. First Timothy, chapter number three, and verse number 16. Everybody have it? And it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Now, could you pull that up in the amplified version? Now, this is why you got to be careful with the theologians and all of these translations because see here's the thing now the King James Version is very hard to read it is I admit it's hard for me to read but the reason why we embrace the King James Version of the Bible the reason why we embrace that over other translations is because other translations were subject to copyright laws so the King James Version it was translated from Hebrew and Greek Hebrew Old Testament Greek New Testament and when they translated it King James pretty much just uh, what do you call that when you copy somebody's paper in, in, in school he plagiarized the scribe the, the, the scribes that wrote in the canon he plagiarized it and there's nothing wrong with that because it's God's word <laughs> so what basically what he did is he copied it and and he and he literally translated it where he could that means he went word for word for word and when he, and then he dynamically translated wherever literal translation was not able to suit the english reader so sometimes he just had to paraphrase because the scholars would tell him look if you translate it word for word it's no longer going to make sense in the english language so you have to translate it like this now other versions of the bible like what version is this this is the Amplified. They wrote the Bible, and they translated it, rather. They were subject to copyright law. So when they, put, uh, when they submitted their translation, it got kicked out because they said it's not different enough from the King James Bible, which is copyrighted. So now you have to make it different enough to get your own copyright. So they had to make the Bible different enough, and any time you have to make to just strive to make something different, you're going to end up lying sooner or later. So that's why we embrace the King James Version of the Bible. Look at what the Amplified Bible says. And great and important and weighty, we confess this hidden truth, the mystic secret of godliness, he, God, in brackets. And I'll explain why they did that. Let's go to, what's another p popular translation? Uh, do you have it in the message? <laughs> the, this Christian life is a great mystery, far exceeding our understanding. But some things are clear enough. He appeared in a human body. What other translation y'all want to look at? Let's look at the NIV. Very good. I like the NIV, but they missed it too. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the spirit. Now he, in the NIV, what they're really trying to do, they're trying to keep Christ and God separate. So what they said is that he appeared in the body. Who? Christ the Savior, the Son of God, the Word manifested in the flesh, appeared in a body and was vindicated by the Spirit, capital S, which is God, the eternal Spirit, the Father. <laughs> they missed it. 
but the King James Version of the Bible hit it nail all. They hit the nail right on the head. That without controversy, great in the mystery is, of the, is the mystery of godliness. God was made manifest in the flesh. God was made manifest in the flesh. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. But if you go to verse 14, it says, and the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh and became the vehicle that God would dwell in. Because the Bible says he had the spirit without measure. <laughs> So when, when, when Philip said, show us the Father, <laughs> and it suffices us, and Jesus said, haven't I been with you long enough? Where you, and you're going to ask me, <clears throat> show us the Father? When you see me, you see the Father. Because the Father is made manifest in me. I'm manifested in my shirt. You don't see not one inch of my arm. You don't see it. You see my hand, but you don't see my arm. But you know my arm is moving <laughs> because the arm of my shirt is moving. You don't, have, you don't see my leg in the pants, but you know I'm lifting my leg up and down because my, my leg is manifested in the pants leg. So whatever you see my pants leg doing, I'm doing. And that's why Jesus said my father works. <laughs> And the Father don't care if it's the Sabbath day. And so if the Father is working on the Sabbath day and the Father is being manifested in me, that whatever you see I'm doing, <laughs> the Father is doing. Because the Father is manifest, God is manifested in the flesh. <laughs> so was God flesh? He was manifested in the flesh. He was the word made flesh. And he said, whatever you see me doing, <laughs> that's the father doing the work. And my father decided to heal somebody on the Sabbath day. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> God was manifested in the flesh. To wit, verse number 19, that God was in Christ. So God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Because here's the thing. Nobody else could do it. And I think that was Isaiah that said that, that uh, the cry was made, uh, I think in Revelation, to, to, to open the books and loose the seal, seals thereon. And he looked in the heavens and couldn't find uh, anybody who was worthy. He looked in the earth and couldn't find anybody that was worthy. Then he looked under the earth and couldn't find anybody worthy. And then Isaiah said that he has borne our griefs because nobody else could do it. Nobody else was perfect enough to be a perfect sacrifice. So God had to come down. <laughs> and he never left glory. <laughs> But he spoke a word. He spoke a word when the angel left Mary. And the Holy Ghost overshadowed her. And that holy thing that was done in her began to grow. <clears throat> and Jesus was born. Word made flesh. And he was filled with the Spirit without measure. The same way a balloon is full of air. You don't see the air, but you know that there's air in it because the balloon has a shape. But he did it because he wanted to reconcile the world to himself. I remember going to business meeting when I was growing up in church. And uh, the, the, the different auxiliaries treasurer would come up and they would read their treasure report. And after they would read their tre treasure report, then the pastor would turn to the church treasurer and the, ask the church treasurer was everything good. And the church treasurer would reply, the accounts are reconciled. And what that means is that the same report that the auxiliary treasurer had, the numbers matched to what the church treasurer had. And so that's what God did for us. He reconciled. In order for somebody to be reconciled, God had to make a transaction. Because 
we were sinful, God is holy. And ever since Adam sinned, it created a division between God and man. So in order for God and man to be reconciled together, man had to become holy or God had to become sinful. And God cannot sin because it's not his nature. Holiness is who he is. So not ever being able to be sinful, he had to make man holy. Verse 21, and so what he did is he made that word made flesh. He made it to be sin for us. So he became sin. It was, he was made sin, rather. Why? Because if we believe on him, the transaction takes place, and we become the righteousness of God and his ambassadors. I hope you got something out of the lesson. And uh, we're going to transition into our uh, afternoon worship. Uh, but we have uh, several ways to give. Uh, you can give through Cash App, Dollar Sign, uh, Praise Temple NC. Or you can give through Giblify, Tap, Give, and Done. It's just that simple. Uh, you can also give through PayPal. You could go to the church's website, Praise Temple NC. Dot org or ptafcnc.org and tap on the donation tab and it will take you through all of the prompts and, and uh, carry you the rest of the way. If you're in-house, you can also give. Uh, we will gladly accept your uh, gifts of cash, card, uh, cashier's check, when you got a card machine, no, just however you give, give it in Jesus' name. And the Lord will give it back to you. Amen. Thank you for your liberal giving. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited this morning. I, it's hard for me to talk about God <laughs> and not get excited in the, in, in how he came in, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. <laughs> that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. I couldn't be righteous like the law, but he put righteousness in me and made me the righteousness of God. Thank you for your liberal giving. Thank you for your liberal giving. We can all stand. Lord, we thank you right now for this day that you have made. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your long-suffering. We thank you for the word that has been sown. Lord, we thank you for the seeds that have been sown into your kingdom this morning. Bless it, multiply it for the furtherance of the gospel. And we thank you right now. Now bless us as we transition into our afternoon worship. Lord, convict somebody's heart today to be filled with your Holy Spirit, to, be, to repent of their sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray, let your anointing rest Lord, let us saturate this atmosphere with your presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Welcome to, to Praise Temple Apostolic Faith Church. We, we welcome all of our e-viewers this morning. We're glad to have you. Glad to see you all with all of your smiling faces behind those masks. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweet his name. Come on, help me say. Tell God thank you. Hallelujah. Somebody tell him thank you. Hallelujah. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Let us pray. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for life, health, and strength. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for food, clothing, and shelter, Lord. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your grace, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your mercy. For it is of your mercy that we are not consumed. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness, Lord. <laughs> oh, God, we thank you for this day that you have made, Lord. <laughs> oh, God, we thank you for the breath that we breathe, Lord. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for victory, Lord. Lord, we thank you for victory over every circumstance that may come our way, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you.
you for victory over death, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you for victory over sickness, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you for victory over every struggle, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you for victory over every trial and, and tribulation, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you right now for the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you right now. Oh, God, we ask that you move in our midst today, Lord. Oh, God, let your own spirit, Lord, rest and rule and apply, Lord, in our midst today, Lord. Oh, God, send an anointing, Lord, that breaks the yoke, Lord. Lord, we thank you right now. Send an anointing, Lord, where bodies may be healed, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Save someone's soul in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you for the victory over every spirit of depression, Lord, over every spirit of defeat, Lord, over every spirit of fear, Lord. For you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we thank you right now. Bless the services, Lord. Oh, God, bless your servant, Lord, as he breaks the bread of life, Lord. Open up our ears so we may hear the word. Open up our eyes, Lord. Open up our minds, Lord, so we can understand your word. Open up our hearts, Lord, so we can accept your word and to help us to sanctify ourselves so we can live your word. And we thank you for it right now in the name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, God, we find the spirit of poverty, Lord. Oh, God, send a wealth transfer, Lord, amongst your people, Lord. In the name of Jesus, you have given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, Lord. Help us to walk in it. In the name of Jesus, and we count it done right now. In the name of Jesus, 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 we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and keep giving God praise. Hallelujah. 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 We count it done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, you are good. Hallelujah. How many know the Lord is good today? Hallelujah, Lord, you are good, hallelujah, and your mercy endureth forever, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together like this. Oh.
one like the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you just for who you are. Hallelujah. Lord, you're so worthy. He's so compassionate. He's so kind. He's so caring. Lord, we worship you for who you are. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Come on and give him praise. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're amazing. Lord, you're forgiving. And we worship, we worship you just for who you are. Hallelujah. Look! 
It's not about us. It's about you. Yes, Lord. Here we are to worship you, Lord. King of kings, Lord of lords, the great I am, Alpha and Omega beginning and end, first and last, bishop of our souls, our heart fixer, our mind regulator, our strong tower, the rock of our salvation. Yes, Lord. We worship him because he's worthy. So we worship him because he's worthy. We worship him because he's worthy of our worship. Michael Jordan can walk in just about any restaurant in the world and wouldn't have to pay, even though he has billions. But they serve him and won't take his money because in their estimation, his name makes him worthy of great service. They'll say, your money is no good here. How much more should we celebrate the God of our salvation? Things may not have worked out this week like we wanted them to work out, but we're here to worship to say, God, if you didn't do it, you had to have a good reason. And so I worship you because not of what, what you have done, but because of who you are. Because of who you are. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. There's a sweet spirit in this place. There is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Yes, Lord. I 
I wonder sometimes, and, and I'm moving, but I wonder sometimes, since we are here for service, I wonder how God feels when he comes to service, when he comes to sit at the table. I wonder, is he pleased? Not just with the things we say, but the things we think. Do we worship him with our thoughts? Do we worship him with our bodies? Do we worship him with our hearts, with our beings? Do we really dedicate ourselves to him? Do we consecrate ourselves? Because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Yes, Lord. Lord. Do we have any first time visitors here? We have one. Is there? We have another. Let's put our hands together and celebrate our visitors. You didn't have to come see us this morning, but we're so glad that you did. We're glad to have you. It's good to see you, and we welcome you on the behalf of our pastor and our leader, Bishop Vernon L. Spinks, and the rest of the Praise Temple Apostles. Welcome! Welcome to Praise Temple, the house of the Lord. Welcome to Praise Temple, the house of the Lord. Welcome to Praise Temple, the house of the Lord. Welcome to Welcome, welcome, welcome. I trust that you feel a little more at home now. <laughs> Amen. At this time, and we can keep worshiping him, but we're going to worship him in our giving. It's offering time in the temple. Amen. And the reason why we say increase when we talk about offering is because God said in his word, he said, give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will men give into your bosom? And I am a witness. I am a witness. You cannot beat God given. You cannot beat God given no matter how hard you try. So we're here to uh, receive the offering. And there are several ways that you can give. You can give uh, via Cash App, dollar sign, Praise Temple NC, uh, or you can give through Givelify. Tap, give, and done. It's just that simple. You can give through PayPal, or you can go to the website, praisetemplenc.org, and you can click on the donation tab, and it will walk you through the rest of the process and you are giving into good ground. If you are here uh, in the sanctuary, uh, we will definitely accept your uh, cash, uh, check, money order. Ca uh, you can give through card. We have a, a card machine for your credit or debit cards. But however you give, give <clears throat> the blessings of God are in this place. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If you want to be blessed, hang out with the blessed. Amen. So it is offering time. Stand and, and we have three attendants uh, with the receptacles ready to face each other and follow the instructions of the usher same way with the uh, center sections. Do we have any announcements? Right. Praise Temple. These are your weekly announcements. Day, May 19th through 21st. 
Daily sessions begin at 9 a.m. with Bible class workshops and evening services at 7 p.m. nightly and 4 p.m. on Saturday. Be reminded that corporate prayer, please don't forget to download and use the Church Center Monday in person or online. We want to know that you are in the house. Thank you for your attention and God bless. Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church be satisfied with your giving. And we're going to uh, bless the offering at this time. Lord, we thank you right now for the gifts that have been sown. They have been sown into good ground. And we thank you and we have faith and trust in your word. That if we, Lord, we thank you right now that we pray bless it and multiply it for the furtherance of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We still have some that are giving. Thank you for, for your liberal gifts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your liberal giving. God is good, isn't he? God is good, isn't he? I'm glad he blessed me with something to give. <laughs> and every time I reap a harvest, with the harvest comes more seed. And with the seed comes another harvest. And with the harvest comes another seed. And so he'll bless, he'll give seed to the sower, <laughs> and then he'll give bread to the eater. We thank God. The word is coming. Anybody excited about the word? Anybody excited about the word? Well, the word is coming, and we thank God for our leader, our pastor, Bishop Vernon L. Spinks, uh, who I have come to know and trust as a true man of God. He speaks the word the unadulterated, uncut, naked word of God. Amen. The word don't have no clothes on when he brings it. And I thank God for that because I would rather hear the truth. <laughs> Give me the truth. And so we thank God. And not only that, he is a soul man. He cares about souls. And I love that about our pastor he does not want to lose a soul. He'll, lose, he'll leave the 99 to see about that one lost sheep. And I thank God for that. Now, he's coming, and let's receive him by standing. And put your hands together and receive the man of God. And say, Bishop Sphinx, preach the word. Preach the word. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm going to ask the choir to come for a minute, Will. Would you please? There's a song called None But the Righteous Shall See God. Anybody ever heard that before? The songwriter said, you got to live holy and you got to be right. Oh. Said, if you want to see Jesus over there, you know what you got to do? You got to get right and let's go home. Can y'all sing some of that for us? Put your hands together and praise
bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. You may have your seats. We greet you in Jesus' name. Certainly honor the Lord for Lady Philistine. Amen. The leading lady. Praise temple. Amen. Thank God. Amen. For the elders, all our elders. Amen. All our ministers of the gospel to the leaders, to you and you, and especially you, those of you that's watching us virtually. We thank God for you. Certainly want to welcome our visitors that are here in the house and those that are virtually. Listen, there is a QR code that you can, can scan if you are a first-time visitor. Make sure that you scan that code with your phone so we can get your information because we want to make sure we touch you. Praise God. Amen. There's a special meet and greet with our newcomers, our new visitors. Praise God. Those that have been for a while and those that are first time, there's a meet and greet this afternoon. It's immediately following this service. So we want to ask that you join us so I get a chance to actually touch you and see you. Praise God. But we're glad and so glad that you're here in Jesus' name. Uh, will you pray for me as we look into the word of God? Can I get you all to pray with me? and pray for me as we look into the Word of God. Will you do that? Praise. This is a dangerous place to be in. I know Elder Brown makes it look easy, and, and some of you other preachers make it look easy, but this is a dangerous spot for me. Hallelujah. I'd rather for anybody to do this other than me. Praise God. But I've been charged, and I've been ordained, so I solicit your prayers that you pray with us in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles, let's look at Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, um, let, let, let's read verse, begin reading at verse 22. I'm going to read some of that. Acts chapter 2, 22. It reads, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye all ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God had raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Verse 32. This Jesus have God raised up whereof we all are witnesses therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost he have shed forth this which ye now see and hear for David is not ascended into the heavens but he saith himself the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God have made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And, and I want you to, to look at this here in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I want you to also look at chapter 17 of Acts. Remember to pray for me. Yes, <laughs> chapter 17 of Acts and verse 23, or verse 22 also. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hills and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, 
I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. Father, we thank you because you've blessed us and allowed us to come together. Anoint us one more time from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet that we might speak under the unction of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, let somebody hear this word today, oh God, and, and cry out, what must I do to be saved, oh God? Let your word go forth unchecked by any four outside force in the name of Jesus. Have your way, oh God. Use us for your glory, oh God. Have your way, God. In the name of Jesus, destroy yokes, lift burdens, heal, set free, deliver. High in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we take authority over the works of the adversary now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan, the Lord God rebuke you. Every spirit that's not like God, we take authority over it now. In the name of Jesus Christ, have your way, Lord. Uh, have your way. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit hath to say unto the church. Uh, call somebody to be saved. Trouble the waters of baptism that somebody might go down in your name and be saved today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. I want to talk about, I think I'm going to use this subject, reaching the church of today with the message of Acts. That's all I could come up with with that, reaching the church of today with the message of Acts, the second chapter. Thank God, amen, for minister Tamara Brockington being with us today. <laughs> Praise God. Also, my daughter from... Fredericksburg, Virginia. Reaching the church today. How many want to reach the church today? How many preachers in here then would like to reach the church today? Hallelujah. Because seemingly to me, the preaching that took place in the book of Acts, that second chapter, praise God, I don't see the same thing happening today. When we preach to the church that happened in this book of Acts, the second chapter. Seems like the church has lost something. I, I said seem. Seem like, seem like we've lost, the church has lost its advantage when it comes to preaching and teaching the word of God. Amen. Because in the world that we live in, when we preach the gospel, I don't get the same results as Peter got on the day of Pentecost. And you can say, well, that was Peter and this is you, but it's the same word. Hallelujah. You see, the world that we live in today is quite different from the world that Peter Live then and it was preaching too. Amen. The world we live in today is not the same even as the world on, on, in 1906 at the Azusa Street Revival. Those folks, when they heard about Jesus, when they heard about the Holy Ghost, those folks did not stop until they received the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. And such a revival broke out that it spread all over this country. As a matter of fact, we are a result of that revival that happened back in 1906. But we're not getting that same results today. As a matter of fact, the world is quite different from what it was in 1976 when I got saved. Because I wanted to be saved. Whatever they told me, I just received it, I believed it, and it was done as far as I was concerned. When they preach repentance and the baptism in the name of Jesus, when they preach come out from among them and be ye separated, when they preach you must be holy for God is holy, I believe what they preached. As a matter of fact, I wasn't satisfied until I had it just like the Bible says. When I got saved, it was only about 12 folks in the church, but all 12 of them came 
came around the altar every time we came to church and we would call on Jesus not because we didn't have the Holy Ghost we called on Jesus because we wanted Jesus we don't have that same type of purple people in the church today you don't want Jesus like we wanted Jesus when I got saved in 76 pray for me we can sit on the back seat our children can sit on the back seat and play with their devices and, and, and play and write notes and draw when the word of God is going forth why? Because this is a different generation than the one that we dealt with in the book of Acts. Hallelujah. This culture has changed. Christian values have changed. Things that we used to count as important and and godly traditions have changed. Things that seemingly was common knowledge to the saints today, amen, it's been passed away. We wouldn't dare curse on the church ground. We wouldn't dare run up here on the altar. We respected God and the house of God that we would not play around with God. If you weren't right, or if you were right, we didn't play, play with God. But it's another generation today than it was when Peter preached. When we make the altar call, and I'll give you a few more minutes and we'll do that. When we make the altar call, we don't get the results that Peter got. The Bible says when Peter preached, and Peter preached, ye men of Israel, Hear these words. Hear what I'm saying. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. We saw miracles and signs and wonders by him right in the midst of you. You have delivered him by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified him and slain him. Nevertheless, God has raised him up, hallelujah, and loosed him because the pains of death could not hold on to him. He said, no man's going to take my life. I'll lay my life down, and if I lay it down, I'll pick it up again. Peter preached because it was not possible. I said it was not possible that death could hold the body of Jesus. Peter preached uh, this Jesus uh, whom God raised up uh, and we all are witnesses of it. Uh, he said he is sitting uh, on the right hand of God, uh, exalted uh, and having received uh, the promise of the Holy Ghost, uh, he have shared abroad this what you see right now. Uh, they were speaking in tongues. Uh, they looked like they was drunk. Uh, they came out of the upper room uh, speaking in tongues uh, and they didn't understand uh, what is this uh, that make me feel uh, so good inside what is this uh, that make me want to run they saw it uh, but they didn't understand it uh, but Peter preached uh, this is the promise of the Holy Ghost that you see that you hear and the Bible says when they heard it when they heard this message preached when those men of Israel heard Peter preach the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts something happened when the word went forth, they couldn't sit in their seat and just be casual. They couldn't sit in their seat and just be at ease. They could just sit around and act like nothing had happened. When they heard the gospel preach, they were pricks in their heart. And they went to the preacher. And they shed 
men and brethren, what shall we do? Wouldn't it be wonderful? I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if so many wanted to be baptized? That Deacon Jones would have to take a break and let somebody else go in the water and baptize him. He baptized 15 and he take a break and Ellen McCormick baptized 15 and he said, wouldn't it be wonderful if after the word go forth that somebody would be pricked, that somebody would realize this word is for me. I need this. What is this? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we would get this reaction? But we're not getting this. Y'all sit down. We're not getting this type of response to the preaching. Hallelujah. When the altar call is made, you looking at your watch waiting, well, we ain't going to make it by 12 today. I guess it's going to be 12, 15. We didn't get out of church to 2, 30, 3 o'clock back in the day. You looking at 12, 15. We're not getting that response, though. You're looking at your clock. And some of you have the nerve to get up and leave as soon as they start singing. I heard the voice. That's when you heard the voice. But it wasn't the voice of the Lord. So you decided it's my time to put up my nasty stuff. Make my exit. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we got this response that Peter got when he preached this Jesus whom you crucified? They recognize they did it. They understand it was me. Anytime that you live ungodly, anytime that you can walk around and do anything you want to do, you are crucifying the Lord afresh. I'm talking to you because Jesus didn't hang on the cross for himself. He died for your sins and the shot on over my sins and every time you can continue in sin you crucify him my friend but what's the difference in these people what's the difference in this group of people and this group of people that I'm preaching to today I believe first of all they were Jews this audience that Jesus that Peter was preaching to it was the primarily Jewish audience. And one thing a good Jew knew is that there is only one God. If a Jew didn't know nothing else, a Jew knew, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Lord, hallelujah. And they knew that this one God created the heavens and the earth. You didn't have to explain to a good Jew how all this came about. You could not convince a good Jew that there was a big bang, big bang theory. You could not convince a good Jew that we evolved from a no evolution was not in their vocabulary. A good Jew recognized that God created ah, the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. And by him all things consist. Hallelujah. A good Jew understood what sin was. They understood what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. They understood, hallelujah, that Adam sinned. And because of 
of sin uh, of Adam that, that death passed on uh, to every man because uh, of the sin of Adam. Uh, they had no doubt uh, that they were sinners uh, and had need uh, of a savior. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they was looking for the Messiah uh, because they had heard uh, that the Messiah would come because uh, the Bible had said through the prophets, uh, hallelujah, that she uh, shall bring forth a son. Uh, the Bible says unto us uh, a child is born, uh, a son is given, uh, and the prophecy said uh, that the government uh, would be upon his shoulder. Uh, and with his strikes, he said, uh, we were going to be healed. Uh, they were looking uh, for that Messiah. Uh, that generation uh, understood uh, they needed redemption. Uh, they understood what it meant uh, to have redemption. Uh, you know what redemption is? Uh, redemption means to be bought back. Uh, hallelujah. And the only way uh, that they could be redeemed, uh, it took some blood. Uh, the good Jew understood uh, that God sacrificed uh, some animals uh, with Adam and Eve sin in the garden. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, that they could be covered uh, because the only thing uh, that can cover sin uh, is blood. Uh, how many know uh, that the only way uh, to get rid of sin uh, is blood? Not any blood, uh, but it had to be, uh, hallelujah, the blood of God. Uh, however, in that day, uh, the Jews uh, would bring animal sacrifices uh, to the temple. Why? Uh, so they could sacrifice uh, that animal, hallelujah. Why? So their sins could be covered. Uh, they had no doubt uh, that they were sinners. Uh, and because they were sinners, uh, they needed a covering. Uh, they needed to be redeemed. Uh, hallelujah. They needed, uh, hallelujah, somebody to help them. Uh, hallelujah. Because uh, they understood uh, that the wages of sin uh, was death. Uh, hallelujah. They also believed uh, what God had said uh, in the book of Genesis uh, when he spoke to Satan. Uh, and he said, uh, I'll put enmity uh, between thee uh, and the woman uh, and between thy seed uh, and her seed. Uh, and it shall bruise, uh, you shall bruise, it shall bruise thy head, uh, but thou shall bruise his heel. Uh, they understood uh, that the seed of a woman uh, was going to be coming along uh, to get rid uh, of what Adam did. Uh, what I'm saying uh, is for, for the most part, uh, these people that Peter uh, was preaching to, uh, for the most part, uh, they understood uh, the knowledge, uh, the history uh, of creation. Uh, they understood uh, who God is uh, and who God was. Uh, they understood uh, that God made everything. Uh, hallelujah. And without him, uh, was not anything made. These people uh, understood uh, that Adam had sinned. Uh, and because of sin, uh, it passed on to them. They understood uh, that the only way uh, they could cover their mess, uh, the only way they could get covered uh, and acceptable with God. Uh, they had to have uh, an animal sacrifice uh, which shed that blood uh, and that blood would cover them uh, for a year and then the next year uh, they had to come back and do it again. This group uh, understood uh, hallelujah you did not have to define to them who God was because uh, in their mind uh, there's only one God. Uh, I knew they had people uh, that served all kinds of God. But this group, uh, when you said God, uh, they thought about the God uh, that created everything. Uh, when you said Lord, uh, they thought about the Lord God uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, this group uh, understood uh, that God wasn't three, uh, but that God was one. Uh, hey! And you cannot convince them uh, that there was more than one God. Uh, they were not polytheistic, uh, but they were monotheistic. Uh, they served just one God. Uh, that's what this group uh, believed. Hallelujah. So Peter uh, didn't have to preach hard uh, like I'm preaching hard this month. Uh, Peter, 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 Peter didn't have to try to convince them uh, that you need to be saved. Uh, Peter, Peter, Peter didn't have to convince them uh, that the Lord God is God uh, and beside him there is no other Savior. Uh, Peter didn't have to convince them 
them uh, and explain to them uh, who the Lord was uh, and what the word was uh, and who God is uh, and what death was uh, and what sin was. Uh, hallelujah! Uh, I heard him say, uh, Hallelujah! Uh, amen! Hallelujah! Uh, that this Jesus uh, whom you crucified, uh, that's what Peter preached to them. Uh, God uh, had made him uh, both Lord uh, and Christ, uh, and because God uh, would not leave him in hell, uh, neither would he suffer the Holy One uh, to seek corruption. Uh, men and brethren, uh, let me tell you something. Uh, David is dead, uh, and David's body uh, is over there in the sepulcher uh, right now unto this day. Uh, but he was a prophet, uh, and one of the things that David said, uh, I heard uh, my Lord uh, say uh, to my Lord, uh, that sounds crazy. Uh, David wasn't talking about himself, uh, but the only way he could see that, uh, it had to be the risen Lord, uh, the risen Christ uh, talking to God. Uh, he said, my Lord, uh, said to my Lord, uh, sit now uh, here on the right hand uh, until I make my enemy uh, thy footstool. Uh, he was talking about Jesus uh, and these people. Uh, I said these Acts people. Uh, I said the people in Acts uh, they believed what they heard. Uh, he didn't have to break the words down uh, and convince them uh, but they uh, when they heard that word uh, they examined themselves uh, and they found out uh, it's not not my sister, uh, it's not my brother, uh, but they found out uh, it's me, oh, hallelujah, it's me, I, I need, uh, I'm standing in the need uh, of salvation, uh, I need a redeemer, uh, I need a deliverer, uh, it's me uh, that was born in sin, uh, shaping in iniquity, uh, it's me, hallelujah, that need help. This Jesus, whom you preach, died that I might live. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Yes, they understood that. But this generation... This generation This generation When they heard the message preached Because when they preached it On the day of Pentecost And the brothers came to, to Peter and said what? Just tell me Just tell me the whole truth And nothing but the truth what must I do to be saved? You know what Peter told him? Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Do you understand? They knew that they needed some blood to cover their sins. But this man is preaching that this Jesus cannot just cover my sins, but this Jesus can remove my sins. Hey! They preached that you no longer have to catch a turtle dove. You no longer have to bring a sheep. You no longer I have to bring a goat. Uh, this Jesus, uh, hallelujah, uh, that God has raised uh, from the dead. Uh, get rid of your animal sacrifice. And take this Jesus home by water baptism in his name. Uh, be filled with the Holy Ghost and he will remove all your sin. And Peter said, and let me help you a little more. The promise that I'm telling you is not for you. It's not just for you. Uh, only to work for you. Uh, but let me help you a little more. Uh, the promises are to you. And this promise is to your children. And I want to tell you something else. Uh, 
even after you passed off the scene, uh, this promise is to as many them that are fall. <laughs> hey, uh, as many as the Lord our God shall call. But this generation of today, when you preach Acts 2, 25 through 38, this generation, they want you to explain something. They want to know. So I looked over in Acts chapter 17, and I saw this generation. <laughs> Paul said in Acts 17, he said, I passed by. He was in Athens. He was in, in Athens, which was among a bunch of, a bunch of Grecians. <laughs> he was among a bunch of Greek folks. Uh, now, I said primarily the people that Peter was preaching to, <laughs> they were Jews, just like none of us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, I said the people uh, that Peter was preaching to, uh, they were Jews, uh, just like none of us. Uh, but over here in Acts 17, I found your people. Hallelujah. Uh, I found our people there. Now, over here in Acts 17, uh, oh, Paul uh, was over uh, in Athens. Hallelujah. Uh, and he said, I passed by uh, and I, I stood in the midst of Mars Hill uh, and I looked around the men of Athens. Uh, and he said, I picked up on something while I was there. Uh, I picked up that you have a form uh, of godliness, uh, but I also picked up uh, that you don't have any power. Uh, something else I noticed uh, when I hung out with you uh, over there in Athens. I'm talking about this generation. Uh, this generation was kind of different uh, from the folks in Acts, the second chapter. Uh, hallelujah. This generation, uh, hallelujah, when I came among you, uh, you had a God for this one uh, and a God for that one. Uh, you had a God for the homosexuals. Uh, you had a God for the lesbians. Uh, you had a God for the alcoholics. Uh, you had a God for the murderers. Uh, and just in case you needed something, uh, hallelujah, that we didn't put a God for. Uh, we're going to put a God over here to the unknown God. Why are you going to do that? Because they don't want to leave anybody out. You see, uh, hallelujah, th these people wanted to include everybody. But I came to tell you, uh, the choir sang the song this morning, none but the righteous. Uh, everybody is not included. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, whosoever will. Uh, you can come, hallelujah. But if you don't come right, uh, you cannot make it. Uh, but this group, this generation, want to include everybody. They religious. Paul said, I perceive that you're too superstitious. But if you check that superstitious out, religious. Or work real good for that. You see, your problem is you're too superstitious. Because I passed by and I found you had an altar to the unknown God. Paul said, I want to talk to you about him. Because you're ignorant. You're worshiping everything. But you don't even know who you worship. I heard Jesus say, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Well, what's the difference in these people over here and the people over there in Acts, the second chapter? Well, the difference is these people don't have a foundation. And the Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, where shall the righteous? Hallelujah. What shall the righteous do? You see what happened to this generation? When mama and them came along and mama and them weren't saved, I said, my mama and them, I know your mama and them, they were saved, but my mama and them, uh, they won't say, but one thing my mom and them did, uh, my mom and them told us, don't you play with God, uh, because they had a foundation. Uh, they was taught, hallelujah, there is God, hallelujah, and you don't play with him. Uh, either you're going to be right or you need to leave that alone, uh, but don't you play with God. Uh, that's what my mama taught us. Uh, my mama taught, hallelujah, you need to respect your elders uh, and obey your parents, uh, because the Bible
Bible. Uh, hallelujah. Said, honor your mother uh, and your father that you might live uh, a long time. My mama and them said, uh, you can't do right and be wrong. Uh, hallelujah. And they said, you can't do wrong and get by. I know uh, they didn't have no scripture going to be a mama. Oh, you ain't. But what happened today, Brother Charles? What happened today because they taught us to dress right. When you went to church, you put some nice stuff on. Mama and them wouldn't let you wear your school clothes to church. Mama and them said you go going to the house of God. And if you're going to go, you're going to look like somebody when you go. I had one shiny shoe, just one. Shiny suit. But I had one. And when we went to church, we laid that out on Saturday night. And we presented ourselves when we went to church. And mama and them would give you a nickel to carry and put in the offering. Because mama and them believe, give when you come to the house of the Lord. Bring. And now they didn't know the Bible, but they had a foundation. These people in Acts had a foundation when it comes to this generation. Paul said, y'all are very religious. Amen. I see you got this altar to the unknown God whom ye ignorantly worship. See, a lot of things have changed, people of God. I said a lot of things have changed. Uh-huh. Even this nation, you can take in God we trust off your money because this nation does not trust in God. This country once was built upon biblical foundation of biblical values, but now it no longer is. But I came to tell you, this generation may be different, but one thing that has not changed, God has not changed. The prophet said, I am the Lord, and I change not. So come generation after generation, God has not changed. And God, who made everything, is still Lord of heaven. So when Paul saw this, he preached, he started preaching again. Peter preached over there in the second chapter. Paul preaching to this generation. These Greeks. And you know the Greeks were Gentiles. And everybody that wasn't a Jew was a Gentile. Do you know your identity? If you wasn't a Jew, you were a Gentile. I don't care if you were born in 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, yeah, I'm country, 80, I ain't got to some of y'all yet, 90, I still ain't got to some of you, 100. <laughs> I don't care when you were born, you not a, if you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. But Paul preached to these, this generation, and this is the generation that we're living in today, the same type of generation that Paul preached to. Paul said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord and heaven, he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples. Why I have to explain to you that God made the world. Why I have to explain to you that he made everything that's in the world. Because this generation has no foundation. Some teacher, some classroom instructor, some professor told them the world came from uh, 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 Adam. There was a big boom, and then the world came. Some professor told you 
that the world began way before Genesis, so you can't believe Genesis. In the beginning, God, y'all, listen, anytime you hear a message and they go beyond Genesis 1 and 1, get on up and you can put your finger up then. Anytime they take you beyond Genesis 1, because some of them going to tell you, before Genesis 1, there was a bomb theory, a bang. And out of that bang came all the stuff that you say. Help us. This generation has no foundation. So when you say God, they say, well, who is God? Because they think Greenbacks is God. They think Santa Claus is God. They think God is the tooth fairy. Why? Because you told them that lie. This generation has no foundation because they've been worshiping the unknown God. And Paul had to preach to them God that made the world and everything in the world is Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not dwell in your little temple that you made with your hands. And neither is he worshiped with men's hands like he needs anything. Let me tell you something. God don't need you. We, you, need God. If you don't praise him, he got some rocks that'll praise him. If you don't praise him, there's some trees that'll lift up themselves. And, and if God don't need you to praise him, you ought to take the opportunity, you ought to take the privilege uh, and just tell the Lord, thank you. You ought to just, you ought to just be thankful uh, and bless his name. God don't need you uh, because God got angels uh, all day long saying, holy, holy, but God don't need you. Uh, you ought to take the opportunity uh, when you rise up in the morning uh, to outdo the bird because uh, you can hear the birds already out there chirping. Uh, I think the bird is telling God, thank you. You ain't got sense enough to get up out of your bed and rise up in the morning and tell that God don't need you. You need God. Paul had to preach it to this generation. It's in him. It's God that giveth life. I got to preach everything to you. Paul said, seeing he don't need you, because he got to give you life. And he got to give you breath. And he got to give you some stuff. Because if he don't give you nothing, you won't have nothing. And without God, we are nothing. Where's your foundation? He took one blood and made all the nations to dwell on the earth. Cut them all. All of us bleed. I don't care what color or ethnic group you're from. We all made by God. And we all were made equal in the sight of God. Hallelujah. And by one blood, all nations of men to dwell on the earth. And he has determined 
before, the times before and the bounds of their habitation. And this is what he said. Paul had to preach this to this generation. That they should, why we got to tell you that you should seek the Lord? Because you're seeking everything else. You so busy with everything else, you ain't had time to seek ye the Lord. Paul said, seek him. If happily, you might feel after him and find him because he's not far from everyone. I'm telling this generation, God is right near. He's right near you. You, 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 you ain't going to find him in the, in the iPad or the or the, or the iPod or the Apple device. You might not find him there, but you come right here and call on him. <clears throat> You'll find out that he's near you. And if you open your mouth and say Jesus long enough, you say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Just, just get the smile and you can smile. Jesus, 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 show, show all your pearlies. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. You say it long enough, he'll, he'll come on in there. <laughs> See, you come up here and you want to close your mouth. We say, say Jesus. 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 You don't want him. Those people, when Peter preached, said, men and brothers, what? But when you run up to this altar and you say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. You don't want him. But if you open your, if you meant business about him, Paul said, he be not far from every one of us. Because Paul said, it's in him we live and we move and we have our being. Hallelujah. Because your prophet even said, your poet said, we are his offspring. And since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like silver or gold or stone graven by some man's head. Stop worshiping this stuff. Stop worshiping these idols that you're worshiping. Look at where you're putting all of your time. And then ask yourself, why am I doing this? When the Bible says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because the day is coming when he's going to judge everything. What I want you to understand, when the Jews heard the word, they understood who God was. Even though when the Messiah came on the scene, they missed him. They called him Jesus. They even told Mary, call him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. But when Jesus came on the scene, the Jews missed him. And these Gentiles right here in the book of Acts, they missed him also. Because Paul said when he began to preach to them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible said, and they began to mock him. <laughs> See, they don't want to know about your Jesus. We get to talking about Jesus hard enough, you're going to get mad. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if you don't have the proper foundation, you're going to be a fool anyway. The foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. God knows those that are his. God has not changed. And I told you the little story the other day about the woman and the man. He was driving down the road, the old man, and she was sitting over there on the other side of the truck. And he said, you don't, you don't sit over here next to me like you used to. And that's what she said. Huh? Sit close to you like you used to. The man said, I ain't moved. God has not moved. I don't care what generation come and what they teach. If they don't teach this word, then you cannot be saved. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be sophisticated. But you got to be born again. Huh? Paul preached Jesus to this generation in Athens. And he said, there is no new thing under the sun. I'm still preaching Jesus. Salvation is only in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, back in 76, I called on the name of Jesus. And I was born again. 
Anybody else that got saved whenever you got saved, you called, didn't you? If you got born again, you got born again, calling on the name of Jesus. Why? Because there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. All men are lost. All men are lost. And all men must be born again. Being religious and going to church and doing good works and paying your dues, that ain't going to get you to heaven. That ain't going to still need to be saved. There's an altar, Paul said, that you had called to the unknown God because y'all didn't want to leave him out. But I came to tell you who this God is. And Paul said, he is Jesus Christ. I came to tell you today, this same gospel that they preach in Acts 2 applies to the same generation that he preached to in Acts 17. So the generation of the Jews and the generation of the Greeks and this generation right here all must be born again. Now I'm not going to take you to the Roman road because you can't get there on the Roman road, Roman road believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. That's not going to get you on the right road. There is a road that seemeth right, but that road ain't going to get you there either. Jesus even said, enter ye in at the straight gate. Huh? Huh? Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that lead to life. But broad is the way that lead to death. And that broad way won't get you there. That's the wrong road. But there is a road that you can get on. And I call it the right road. <laughs> and Peter preached it that day. This same Jesus is the way. Not a way, not some way but the way the only way that you can get to God you must come through Jesus Christ Paul preached it Peter preached it I'm preaching it today you must be born again and salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ not just for my generation for your generation too you know what's going to save our 10-year-olds and our 6-year-olds and our 12-year-olds and our 17-year-olds, you know what's going to say them? The same gospel that saved me and saved my pastor and saved our fathers that have gone on to be with the Lord. The same gospel. So what we must do is continue to preach this gospel. You must be born again. They asked Peter, what must we do? Peter said, repent. If you need me to explain that to you or need somebody to explain it to you, come on to the altar. They explain it to you. Repent. That repent means you turn away. Turn away from where you're going and go toward God. Change your mind about sin. See, the wages of sin is death. And if you practice sin, you're going to die separated from God. But when you repent of your sins, you turn from that and you go toward God and be baptized because baptism is necessary in the name of Jesus Christ. What do you need that for? So your sins won't just be covered, but so your sins will be removed, washed away, and then you shall receive. Not might, not maybe, but you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you're here today and you have not been born again, if you're here today and you are not, have not made Jesus your Savior, I want to invite you to come today and make a choice to make Jesus your Lord. 
the altar is open for you to come. You've heard it, even this generation. God has done everything. The government can't save you. The president can't save you. Mama can't save you. Daddy can't save you. Your money can't save you. Nobody saves but Jesus. Jesus completely delivers you from sin and sinning. Are you here? Do you want to be saved? You can come. Do you want special prayer? You can come. Will you come and let the Lord help you? I heard the voice, the voice of Jesus say, of Jesus Clap your hands for these children. Come unto me. Come unto me. Uh -huh. came just as I was, just as I oh, was. I was weary, weary and, and worn and, and sad. sad, yes I was, but I found in him, found in him a sweet resting place, resting place. oh, he has made me glad, he has made Sister Green, would you help us please? Of Jesus say, of Jesus say, oh, come unto me, brother Baker, come Minister Baker, would you help us, please? Uh -huh. and pray. Oh, lay down, lay down thy weary, thy weary one, we lay down thy head upon thy bread. Want me to pray for her? I came to Jesus. I came to Jesus. I came just as I was. Just as I was. Oh, I was weary. Weary and worn. In my mask, please. And sad. I found in him. I found in him. A resting place.
I heard the voice. I heard his voice one day. Your hands in praise. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Mama. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for every soul, oh God, that have come to the altar. You see, Lord, and you know. Oh God, do it for your glory right now. Thank you for that soul that made a decision to go down in your name, Lord. Uh, cause their repentance to be sure and fill them up uh, with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I might say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, oh God. Uh, oh God, let your word, hallelujah, as you said, not return void, oh God, but cause hearts to be pricked, uh, souls to be saved in the name of Jesus. Uh, oh God, as we declare and displaced but never from your presence uh, we pray that you would encamp your angels around us give us traveling mercies bring us back together at the appointed time may the grace of our lord and savior jesus christ and the sweet communion of his holy spirit rest rule and abide with each of us now henceforth and forevermore all the people said amen god bless you praise the lord praise temple these are your weekly announcements the Holy Convocation of the Atlantic Regional Conference convenes Thursday through Saturday, May 19th through 21st. Daily sessions begin at 9 a.m. with Bible class workshops and evening services at 7 p.m. nightly and 4 p.m. on Saturday. Visit our website at arcpcafi.org to register for this event. Please be reminded that corporate prayer is each Sunday morning at 8 a.m., Mondays at 6.30 p.m., and noon on Wednesday. Lastly, Please don't forget to download and use the Church Center mobile app to self-check in yourself and or your family when you attend our services. Whether you're visiting in person or online, we want to know that you are in the house. Thank you for your attention, and God bless. Thank mm -hmm. you.